So our students, they have been working on uh, challenges that they identified in, at universities in their work. Um, and they, they will be proposing solutions and justifying these solutions uh, in presentations today. There are four groups and uh, each group has 15 minutes um, to explain all these three elements. So to present the challenge, to present the solutions that they propose, and to uh, justify why they think this is relevant and why they think this solution will work actually for, for the challenge that they identified. So I'm really curious to, um, to hear them. And uh, today, especially, we'll be focusing on, on students' view for the whole day. So um, in the morning, we'll be looking at the challenges and solutions. In the afternoon, we will uh, look at the whole list of things that universities should know about educational technology, and our students believe they don't. Um, and uh, after that, we will uh, wrap up with a panel, uh, also made out of uh, four students representing four partner universities and moderated by Blair Stevenson from Oulu. So let's start it. Okay. So group two uh, will present their uh, already named product, Relate It, uh, Community Building and Feedback. That would be their focus. And we have uh, Caroline Purcell, Vivian Lydini, Arnaud the Keeper, Lucy Reed, and Noor Yunis presenting today. All yours. All right, so uh, good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, Relate Ed presentation. Um, first, we will talk about challenges online that actually lots of students relate to. Uh, then we will talk about our proposed solutions, uh, while they will work, and uh, something about our business plan. So first of all, um, I will talk about the challenges we discovered um, we found actually a number of challenges um, by conducting uh, some student interviews and we initially assumed that the majority of students um, experienced problems in learning how to learn uh, online autonomously. Um, but however, um, after reviewing all our uh, interviews together, uh, the main concern was actually that there is a lack of online community and social interaction. Uh, not only between students, uh, but also between student and teacher, uh, in the sense that there is a lack of two-way communication between teachers uh, and students. And I experienced that lack of two-way communication actually quite heavily during uh, my five years at university uh, when attending lectures and also after the lectures, actually. Um, the profs keep talking and talking and explaining and explaining for hours and hours and most uh, of the time uh, at a pace by which it becomes very hard uh, for students to keep track uh, of understanding the content during the lecture uh, and from then it becomes uh, hard to not lose uh, your concentration um, and i feel the same nowadays most of the time when everyone has to attend online lectures uh, the one-way communication uh, simply moves from face-to-face -face lectures to online uh, lectures and now it's even harder nowadays uh, because you don't yeah you don't have any classmates sitting uh, next to you uh, to discuss the lectures afterwards. So um, creating a sense of online community is really needed to satisfy social interactions, uh, to exchange questions and answers, uh, to get feedback uh, and to stimulate the two-way communication because that's very important. So it's very important uh, in order to get as much uh, as possible out of the university experience. Uh, also to get more chances in getting help, uh, to feel part of something uh, and for well-being, especially during uh, these times. So we've got um, two branches of online solutions, uh, which will cater for all of these points previously mentioned. We have free ones, which will imply simply kind of a different mindset and different timetabling for tutors and universities. And then we also have a paid solution, which is our app. So um, in order to fulfill well-being and support, one of the first suggestions was that research questions that come up for students or asked by the tutor and daily life concerns can be discussed in a doodle created Zoom sessions with a tutor for 45 minutes each week instead of silent forum platforms, which many people don't find very satisfying. For learning and discovery, having regular online workshops and small teams 
of other students to learn additional skills needed for the course, such as Miro, library searches, academic writing, statistics, whatever gaps you, you have, so that everyone starts eventually from the same page and you've got the same baseline. Then in order to help with the sense of belonging, which is sorely missing at the moment, um, having coffee chat sessions after lectures between students. So there could be a different button on Zoom, for example, or someone starts a new session. And this would be a way of imitating real life and how students usually connect together. Um, towards the university experience, it would be good to have bi-weekly or monthly literature review groups of some of the reading material with a tutor to discuss papers in more depth and iron out any misconceptions. And the groups would be smaller, five or six with a tutor on one or two papers. Another free solution would be um, to have student to student Q&A sessions with former students. So that would be in Freshers' Week or the first week of a course. Um, we suggested maybe a daily one hour session um, so that these students who've done the course can point out challenges and things to watch out for and generally give advice and also manage expectations because sometimes what students think about a course before they join it is not the same thing as when they actually start it. Um, so this could even lead to less dropout rates um, because there'd be less misunderstandings going on. And then the last free solution would be um, in order to create well-being and a sense of belonging is having cultural experiences such as online concerts or stand-up comedian nights or art projects. Um, this would create new ways of meeting other students differently, leading to again a sense of community and could even perhaps be led and generated by students from other departments such as art or music and could perhaps then allow them to get ECTS credits for such um, projects. So now we'll go to our paid solution. So this is going to be an app called Related. Um, and so because some of the solutions we've already proposed will add a bit of a burden to the tutors time-wise, we also wanted to find a way to facilitate two-way communication that would be very efficient and wouldn't take too much time. And so our solution is this app related. Um, it allows students to start conversations as they would do on a typical web forum. But the difference is here that at related would use algorithms to sort, clean and group questions queries and conversations into topics and themes. So it would clean by getting rid of old things that are no longer relevant and not necessary. This would enable professors uh, to read what their students are thinking about and to pick up on the biggest concerns. That way their weekly live sessions or Q&A sessions would become more efficient as they're able to provide more targeted feedback and hopefully more introverted students would hopefully be heard as well as they be, find it easier to participate. Um, this would help professors and students to foster relationships with each other and to students to deepen their relationships with their peers. Um, they would also then be better able to relate to their subject area and feel part of a community at the same time. There could be a mixture of formal and informal conversations such as what are they doing at the weekend, just again to find people who share interests. Um, so essentially it would be a forum that makes it easier for users to see how they are related to others within their edu educational context and for tutors and administrators administrators to see what is working and what isn't and an add-on would be to connect more widely out to the world which Muir will explain now. Yes exactly so we not only want to create this app and these forums for uh, people to um, be able to get feedback but what we are aiming to do is to create this network effect to connect students through for example notes and knowledge sharing at both a local and global level. With these, I mean that we want to connect students within universities so that they, we can reinforce this sense of community that we are trying to um, boost or, or create, right? But also at a global level so that students can help out to each other and students that have the same interests or perhaps are interested in, in the same extracurricular activities can connect and um, get to know each other better in this online setting that we're having right now. Um, moreover, not only um, will we will create this network effect for students, but also for universities so that they can, um, so for example, uh, all the departments that we have in one university can connect and can um, share their experiences and their best practices, but also we would like to do this at a global level so that 
students can experiment and try different approaches to this teaching or this new um, ways of learning and they can uh, see what's working and what's not and um, provide a more um, exciting learning experience. Um, so okay, um, I will talk about um, the reasons for our proposed solutions. Um, so I guess we have to go to the next slide. Okay, so in terms of the reason for um, our proposed solution. So first of all, like uh, my, my group mates just mentioned. So in terms of the platform, we allow sharing of ideas and advice. And it also allows the students and even professors to connect and even uh, for debates to flourish. And second of all, um, the, the building of community will, will have a very like schedule through stable like schedule uh, interactions between students among students and among students and professors um, and at the same time while building the community um, they can share different types of like experiences and knowledge which simulate a real life um, you know experience and setting and they also able the bonus of creating community is they're able to create share experiences and, and also memories and the other uh, reason for creating this solution is um, the possibility of having like peer tutoring because when students can support each other and help each other, that will reduce a lot of confusion and also feeling loss um, or even like reducing the dropout. And in terms of this free solution, um, it's, it's actually involving very low cost. It's just about uh, organizing logistics and even organizing some other like teaching resources and supporting um, resources. Um, so that's the reason for the free solution. So we go to the next slide. So in terms of reason for developing the paid version, so some of the reasons that we just talked about, but we'll just highlight some of the key uh, reasons for the paid version. So first of all, um, with this platform, we're able to group and clean and sort different types of like discussions, um, posts um, using technology. Um, and then second of all, um, we're able to allow students to be connecting with tutors, uh, which uh, can help them to force a sense of community and even building the relationship like what they do in real life. And third of all will be the network effect, which um, uh, my group may just talk about. So it's not just building a community within their own university or among your peers, but we're talking about building a network among the university network so that you know, students can share the experiences and the, uh, exchange knowledges. Um, and then the last would be in terms of the cost of the paid version, there will be alternative way, uh, which we'll talk about later on in terms of uh, you know, crowdfunding the res financial resources that are needed uh, for developing this paid solution. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a bit about the business plan now. Um, our business plan involves working with a team of development universities, which on this slide are called kind of the tier one development universities. So the idea is that these universities would provide expertise to the developers around how related should sort, group and clean the forum content. Um, and in addition to being responsible for steering decisions around broad functionality and compatibility with existing systems. So in, in doing that, they're informed and assisted by a tier two partners. Um, so these would be kind of individuals such as professors, tutors, students at other universities, developers and learning designers feeding into that decision making process. So um, their development would be um, mainly to help mitigate any risk um, that's inherent in developing something that's brand new um, and it also has commercial value in that it helps spread awareness and anticipation of, of the platform um, in the market. Tier one university partners also have an important function in making the product financially viable. So the development cost is split between them in a kind of a crowdfunding type model. Um, and in return for their investment, they um, would receive free um, access to the platform. Other universities would have to pay a license to, to access the, to have the platform for their students. Um, so in addition to the tier one and tier two partner groups, we would also need to work with university management themselves so that um, to make sure that related is completely compatible with existing organizational structures. We would also work with um, 
uh, learning management systems um, such as Moodle, um, Canvas and so on um, to make sure that related blends in with the existing um, platforms that, that are already available and the forums that are available there. So both of those relationships would mean that we would be maximising the chances of a easy adoption of, of the product within university environments. So the revenue stream um, would be generated by um, licensing um, the, the, the platform to all universities who are not part of tier one. Um, and that subscription type model would mean that we would be able to generate regular um, forecastable predictable income, um, which means we would then have a stream available to us to invest back into the business. Um, so we're aware that um, in doing a bit of research on, on this, that there are existing platforms available. Um, some of them, um, in looking at them, uh, have some differences to what we're proposing. So uh, our platform looks far more at building a, a holistic community. So looking at what is going on in the individual student's life, be that academic and, um, uh, and social kind of um, uh, interactions as well. So um, using that to make sure that we are um, you know, building a, a platform that's completely focused around around their lives and the different aspects that that are there. So it's not just the academic, but it's also not just the social either. And when it is the academic, it's the academic that's personal and specific to their environment. Um, so it, it encompasses all of that. So that the aim there is that it reduces isolation in all forms, which has benefits for mental health. Everything is related um, and for everyone that has an impact on all aspects of their life, which is something I think increasingly universities need to be um, taking notice of in terms of the mental health of their students. Um, also, um, most of other, other um, apps like this are for um, a student pays type model. Um, this one proposes that the university would subscribe, so that would ensure that all students would have access, which means it's truly inclusive and not just available to only those who could afford to pay. Um, it also enables that network effect, the more people who can be involved, the broader the network, the more connections that can be made. So that's both within your university environment, but also the kind of window into the world that it provides um, in terms of linking to other university departments, as we've described. Um, so that's it, I think. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and um, that's all from us, but we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, congratulations for a very good presentation. And uh, not, not only the way of presenting, but I love the, the way you, you presented it and uh, the PowerPoint that you shared. It's really good, well done. Um, and uh, well, my question would be actually, if I may, um, do you think, for example, the, the free part uh, that you suggested, so all the hours spent, the, the 45 minutes for Q and A's, um, do you think this should be part of the syllabus? Should it be an additional thing? Uh, because I'm thinking about all the hours that people spend um, with their studies already, and many of people uh, work at the same time. So Q and A sessions, workshop, coffee chats that you that you talk about right now. I mean that, that you presented right now. Um, should it be part of the program, or should it be something additional? How how to fit it in our busy schedule? I'm happy just to go first on this before one of the others wants to. So I would say some of them, such as the literature review, should be part then of the program. Yeah, so that you're ensuring that students are reading and understanding what's going on and they're able to have a discussion. Because this is one of the biggest things missing right now, that you can't just say silly things to your tutor because you've misunderstood it and they can clear it up and help you sort out what your thinking is around it. So that for me, yeah, would be literature, would be part of the course. Coffee chats would be optional for each student. Workshops, again, would be optional if students felt they were missing out on something. But it, again, it shouldn't be paid. At the moment, you have them in universities, but you often have to pay extra for them. So the idea would be that it's just something you can pick up, up on if you need. And for the Q&A sessions, again, I think that would be optional, but it would be nice to make sure that students did take part maybe at least once a term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here, another question that comes to my, to my mind is how to encourage students because how to encourage students to be to actively participate in it because very often they would just appear in the online room and they would be silent not knowing what to do so the, the leadership of the professor and each professor from each subject would be necessary right 
Well, again, that would, yes, I suppose so. Again, it would depend on how many different teachers you have for all the subjects that you're doing. But like, if you have mm -hmm. a module based version, then during that module, it would be that tutor who will manage that. So it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be have 20 tutors at the same time. So you mm -hmm. would reduce then how many tutors are needed for each session. Um, but again, that's the point of the, the forum is that with the paid app, you see the forum would pick out on what the what people are saying and then be able to directly talk about that so in which case really the need to look make sure they match well but that therefore they would address the main questions that come up which hopefully would reduce um, you know some students not participating mm -hmm. great i see uh, that you that you've been responding some questions in the chat already uh, one that i haven't seen a response to is um why uh, students would use a new app I'm having all the apps out there why why would students use a new one? Shall I answer that one? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I think that um, I think that's why we kind of looked at the importance of making it blend in with the existing forums that are there um, and the existing kind of um, organizational structures that they're already part of. I think that really is crucial. I think, you know, in addition to that, there's also social media, um, you know, platforms that they'll be on and sharing things with their friends um, additionally. Um, but I, th I think it goes back also to that key point that, you know, if you look at what is going on in a, in a student's life at, at any one time, it, it, it's there's the academic um, sort of strands to it there, there's also the sort of social strands and I think the existing platforms at the moment are either one thing or the other everything's very compartmentalized so you either have the sort of forums provided by your university which are for academic interaction or you have your social media which is for other things um, and I don't think that necessarily helps the sense of connection it's it's it still forces people into sort of very siloed um, sort of aspects of their lives. So the idea here is to is to bring everything into one place, um, but still make it um, small enough that you're you're um, interacting with your immediate peers um, and building um, a community around um, what's going on, kind of in in your own sort of sphere of life. So I think it's that integration yeah. that I suppose is is um, something that we identified as missing from the existing networks that they may be using yeah can i also add something to that as well just very quickly so also this idea of like making it into that network effect that was also that for example say you have a lot of students in in england and they're all studying educational technology they could connect with each other to find out how things are managed in their different universities and thereby create an additional network of students within the same subject frame um, and perhaps they could help each other find solutions in different ways but additionally the tutors who are teaching those courses could also have access therefore to those other networks in the same topic field and perhaps between tutors find better solutions for managing problems they have in their in their universities so that's also the other the side of kind of connecting people usefully together well especially the second part i think edn should be uh, looking at uh, implementing it <laughs> all across <Yeah>. europe <laughs> 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 wonderful uh, peter is asking in relation to the paid version have you investigated a publisher model taylor and francis of emerald etc lucy <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, yes, I, I guess that um, uh, I, I work for a publisher. So part of the inspiration for the sort of um, the business model side of things was um, models that I've seen used um, by some publishers. So so, yes, that that was um, some of the kind of inspiration behind behind the the, the model we suggested. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that was part of it. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was really good. So congratulations. Thank I could you. see that <laughs> many people are congratulating you here in the in the chat and I definitely uh, I, I'm part of that group. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Um, so let's move on to the group three um, and uh, their developing competencies for employability. Katerina, Sam and Sinisha, are you with us? All yours then. So here we go. Um, so yeah, as uh, Milena said already, um, my name is Katrina and Sam and Zanisha will be presenting on behalf of our group today. And um, 
Before talking about our challenge, um, I want to show you these, or I want to start with these questions, which are, describe a situation in which you led a team. Give an example of a situation where you solved a problem in a creative way. Or tell me about a time when your communication skills improved the situation. Now, these are some exemplary questions from a competency-based interview. Um, one might get asked in an actual job interview. And if you apply directly after university, freshly graduated with no work experience, you will usually have a really tough time answering these questions, uh, which is basically a real problem because social skills, communication skills, creativity, leadership are really just some of the so-called 21st century skills uh, needed to successfully stand one's ground in today's and future job environments. So the problem we identified is that students lack practice and competency skills needed for their job environments. But um, how should universities and educational institutions in general teach these skills? Uh, well, we think the answer is not at all, as we think that you cannot really teach skills, but you have to help students acquire them. So before talking about our solution, I want to quickly show you what others say about skills to really emphasize why it is so important to learn them or to acquire them. So Essentia, for example, um, sees a real crisis coming due to skill gap. And this chart shows uh, the potential loss in GDP growth if countries cannot meet future skills demands and if they don't start using technologies and the potentials they offer and if they really don't teach their workforce how to use those technologies. Um, this list was published by the World Economic Forum and shows the top 10 skills employees should have, or well, ideally should have, to keep up with the demands on the job market. Now, what's the solution then? So mm -hmm. our solution um, is not a new tool um, but a learning space for competency training that can be integrated into an existing tool. So take Moodle, for example. Um, this is a screenshot uh, showing my Moodle account. And as you can see, uh, there is a um, category in, on the top where it says student help. So this could be an exemplary place to integrate our training space uh, university-wide, and it would allow every student in the university to reach it easily. Now, this integrated side would offer students the chance to tailor their competency training to their needs. Um, that means they can choose from a variety of different courses, for example, communication training, critical thinking and analysis, media literacy, and so on. So they can listen to expert talks, work in groups with other students, or just network with experts. And um, like that, students can develop competencies they feel they lack or where they feel they need to become better. This is really the general idea of the platform, um, but universities or rather teachers can connect their departments or modules to this platform and tailor it to the needs of their students. Um, we suggest this because different areas require different competencies or at least the list of competencies um, might be ranked in a different way uh, for different subjects and work environments. Um, so uh, like basically how could this tailored solution look like? Um, I want to take art history students as an example. So after finishing their studies, um, art history students can start working in research and auction houses and galleries and museum pedagogy and cultural institutions or tourism. And these are really just a few possibilities. Now going through the curriculum as usual, which is learning lots and lots and lots of theory and writing essays, it's um, quite unlikely um, that it's useful to all students because it won't prepare them adequately for their later careers. Now our solution, um, this integra integrated competency training um, could help in that art history teachers, um, <clears throat> sorry, can bring in experts from a variety of fields, like I said, auction houses, museums, and so on. And those experts can provide 
um, talks and give students a real insight into their work environment and how students will use um, what they learn in their potential later jobs. Um, experts will also be able to prompt students with uh, exercises they will face um, in, in later jobs so that students can make the connection between theory and practice. And in case our art history students, uh, or in case of our art history students, um, this might be planning an exhibition, making a market analysis for the next auction, designing a pedagogical program for a museum and so on. So students can choose the fields they are interested in, work collaboratively on projects or individually, um, maybe even work on real projects together with the experts, for example, in a sort of mini internship and um, obviously network with those experts. Um, further, such an integrated learning space um, can give students a great opportunity to also familiarize themselves with digital tools that are used in their future work environments. So this way, students will engage actively and not only passively take in knowledge, um, they not only learn how to transfer their theoretical knowledge to real life situations, and actively engage in forming their ideas, but um, they practice skills needed for their later jobs as well. And uh, if I may add, uh, one of the solutions is actually also not only the Moodle learning uh, management system uh, platform, but also encourage students to use uh, uh, other uh, learning management system platforms, such as Blackboard, edX, Linekin, Coursera, Echo, Edmond of uh, Music First um, and, and many more uh, uh, adjusted to their learning needs and skills they need for their future jobs. Uh, what is also important is uh, to offer programs outside their uh, main curricula, meaning uh, uh, within the skills needed for better employability. Uh, as Katarina said, uh, digital and the non-digital skills, uh, mostly soft skills, uh, we believe that the system is overrated and somehow emphasized uh, as one of the most uh, vital, uh, the STEM uh, education is one of the most uh, vital and important fields, but also we need to take into account also the other fields and other uh, subjects uh, in the society. We, we also believe that uh, the focus is should be on more only not only the technical and uh, science parts, but also uh, really focusing uh, uh, about uh, interconnections with the soft skills, allowing students uh, to gain collaborative skills, uh, teamwork skills, uh, improve their communication skills in many uh, aspects and fields. Uh, also, that uh, to have that uh, human dimension uh, in, in the whole process, especially in the in the job market, uh, they need to, uh, apart from their expertise, they need to be really uh, team players and uh, in, in be able to communicate effectively, to, to lead the group, uh, like Katarina already mentioned. So all those skills are uh, very important for the job finding and uh, integrating uh, to, to their new environments. Uh, we also would like to emphasize that uh, apart from the the solution that uh, uh, to propose the, you, you, uh, to use existing university integrated uh, learning platforms uh, uh, because the benefits are uh, obvious. So, so they reduce the cost of launching similar platforms because they are already, we have enough tools and platforms already existed. Uh, students need to focus on their learning and study so they don't have time to really to invent unless they are really inventors. And also uh, one of the benefits is quick, quick access uh, for all users. We also think uh, that apart from the, their main universities, their study, they can also use some free of charge or with limited uh, costs, uh, other applications and tools uh, they could uh, uh, gain and uh, knowledge and uh, improve their skills. And uh, one of the benefits is also uh, an already known supportive learning environment, meaning that they could watch uh, with their peers or individually, so they could uh, really discuss uh, later on a usage of, of such tool. Is it uh, good or bad, or is it practical or not in their future jobs? Also, one of the benefits can be uh, uh, easy development uh, of new webinars according to the needs of the students uh, and the requirements for university departments. We mean uh, 
that uh, actually the, within the the same university, other departments can also place their uh, additional uh, uh, webinars, videos uh, that could also boost and improve uh, students' uh, skills apart from the curriculum, but that can be also uh, linked with the real reality uh, needs of, of the sector because the technology is really rapidly, rapi rapidly it's improving over each year. So uh, when the student starts the, their studies and uh, when the student is complete, uh, maybe complete uh, market is changed or, or the new skills are required. So it must be on, on board and ongoing uh, it's like promotion of continuous learning. So the students really need to take a proactive approach and to be with uh, their, uh, their reality and also demands of, of the market. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So, Can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Sinisa and Katharina. Um, so the justification for our solution, um, as already um, highlighted by Sinisa, is the fact that um, um, employers are demanding more from graduates than just the degrees um, or the, sub the subjects that they are studying. So we believe that the competency skills are very necessary for people that are going into the market. Of course, most universities uh, may already have some kind of career programs in place, but we think that because of the whole uh, pandemic and COVID situation, there needs to be an opportunity for students to actually engage more in this area because at the end of the day, most, most our students are going to university so that they can become entrepreneurial or go into the work market. And so if the skills that they need for, um, for employment are not adequately provided by the universities that they are, you know, they are learning from or whichever higher education platform that they are using for their, um, their academic um, learning, then there will be that, that gap between what they study and what the employers need from them. So we reviewed um, some literature that actually supports the idea that indeed, it is important for students to have the skills that they need to fit into the employment, uh, employment market. And also we conducted a survey. We sent out a, um, a learner experience survey, which has 12 questions. And I believe if we have time, we can show some of the um, the questions from the survey. And the responses from the survey did indicate that about nine out of 13 of the responses indicated that the employer, employability skills were very high and important to students. So we feel that, of course, that sends the message that um, universities need to do more, even though there may be some, um, some, um, some programs in place, like I mentioned earlier on. And that is why, again, we're proposing an integration into the already existing platform so that students are already familiar with a platform or already familiar with a learning environment. And so if they need to then go onto their Moodle page, for example, to as an add-on to get additional skills, then it becomes, it becomes easier for them. Um, if Katharina can show the next slide, please. Yeah. Right. So our uh, question eight, as you can see from there, this is, um, this is from one of our, it's just an excerpt from the, um, the learner experience survey. So it's showing that the building skill set for employment is really, really critical in addition to the life lo lifelong learning, which obviously we'll talk about skills like um, communication, critical thinking, networking, which have become um, so essential lately that if students don't have them or students lack them, they will definitely face that challenge of then having to get the employers to train them to take on to actually build or develop these skills. But we believe that if the universities can actually go on to provide these um, skills in addition to the learning that the students are receiving from their, you know, their higher education um, institutions or the learning platforms that they are using, 
then there is a seamless um, kind of approach. There is no break in the whole um, in, in the whole equation. So again, um, the next one, please, Kasprina. Yes, so this question also um, asks students about the competencies. And these are some of the competencies that we actually highlighted, creativity, collaboration, communication. And then again, we can see that the, um, the social skills and of course, um, time management topped the list. These skills we got from our, respond our respondents indicates that yes, um, there is justification for the problem, the challenge that we have, and also the solution that we are proposing. Um, yeah, that is it. If there are any, um, any questions, we can take them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well done, well done. And I especially like that you didn't propose to invent new things and very often innovation is not about uh, cr creating something completely new and new, introducing new technology, but it's actually about looking around at the tools that we've already got in place and innovating around them. So introducing some improvements to what we've already got. And I think it's a very, very good idea. And uh, I see it happening. I see it happening because it, it looks easy to me. I mean, I, obviously at the uh, moment of implementation, it won't be that easy. But um, it sounds like, it, it doesn't sound overwhelming, which normally happens when you hear about a new proposal of a new uh, technological solution to, to improve education. So well done, thank you very much. Um, looking at the questions, and we have one. Can it be uh, regarding, regarded as an advanced career service? Um. Kafrina, do you want to take that or do you want me to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I can start. Well, it's um, sort of yes and no. Um, we definitely give students the possibility to network. And like we see on this program as well, networking is really key, you know, for, um, for future uh, jobs and everything, you know, just to, to build knowledge and all these um, positive things that we experience now as well. But it's really to, to give the students a possibility to connect their knowledge they acquire at university with the practical side, because this is what really lacks, we feel at least, and what we also experience at university, that you take in all this amazing knowledge and theory, and then you go to, to a job and you don't know how to use it. So it, it's really more about um, this transfer from knowledge to practice. Mm -hmm. And um, just, to, just to add to that as well, um, in one of the earlier sessions, um, Professor Rose Larkin did indicate that the problem with technology lately is that most of the new technology try to transform what already exists. So we believe that um, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. And so, for example, um, developing these skills by the universities, because most universities already have the platform. They already have the connections with the employment market because they host symposia, events, and invite um, people from, the, um, from employment to come and speak to students already. So this will be an add-on, except that given the current pandemic, the focus will be a lot more. And somebody also did indicate in the chats that um, do we think that it can work with gaming and um, bots as well? Yes, it, obviously, once the university has its own platform, there is the opportunity for it to expand that existing platform to involve or inculcate all these other learner platforms that would help to um, develop the competency skills in students. So of course, um, we believe that having, having a platform that is already existing is important and it should be taken advantage of rather than trying to always um, create a new um, technology or a new platform that students then have to get used to, a lot of investment has to go into it. Whereas if you take the ones that's already existing, um, yeah, most people are used to it and it's easier to then go on from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good point. And actually Italo here is pro proposing even easier solution than that, instead of practicing the skills, uh, what about training those interview skills? Can that happen in the solution you, uh, you propose? 
Of course, definitely. I think um, the closer students get to graduating, the more important it gets to really prepare them for what they will face in such interviews. And this is why we say um, to onboard experts really, so that they can give insights, what is important for those job interviews? What are the qualifications you really need for them? What you have to prepare for? And um, I assume it's really about um, what you agree on with them, but I think it's, there is definitely a chance so that they can practice interviews with those students to properly prepare them. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, uh, Vivian is asking, uh, have you thought about integrating this type of training into the formal university curriculum? So do you propose it as something additional or something that is part of the, of the syllabus? No, well, the, um, the general idea is really to put it on, on, the, on the side where everyone can access it. But that's why I said this is like the, the general solution. The, the solution we are more into is that teachers and departments really connect it to, to their modules. So, you know, bringing in experts into the module so that, I don't know, if we stick to art history, uh, those students... Um, can actually learn how to use their knowledge on Renaissance art or whatever it is in, in the real world and to bring in experts from auction houses who deal with that or museums and so on. And then really make learning active so that they start again, you know, transferring knowledge into um, like real world situations and yeah, definitely integrated in the curriculum. I think that is uh, really important. Mm -hmm. All right, and now uh, have you, uh, so did you inter uh, do any interviews with, sorry for that, uh, did you do any interviews with employers uh, or students? Uh, can I jump in for that um, interview employers things, Katarina and, and uh, sorry, a team? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we didn't interview employers. However, I am doing the thesis program. And I'm, I'm writing, I'm also like working on the thesis from uh, my university, which is also related to um, that uh, topic. And uh, I would say like, you know, uh, it's also like one of the, um, what's called it, issue they have because this, sorry, um, can anyone from English speaking um, country uh, have my English? It's called a discrepancy like something that the difference is in between that uh, um, the expectation from employer side and also like, you know, the, the things um, uh, employee has, like excuse the, the, the empl employee has is different. Uh, Discrepancy in English. But anyway, um, yeah, it's also challenging for the employers, um, like, you know, um, like, you know, to, um, like employer side also like having some um, issues that like you know students have um, like skill that's not employer sides are not expecting. Um, so I would say um, somehow like this practical uh, training would be really um, like somehow like key point for them to check and also like um, through the interview to check like how they uh, answer for realistic solution which they can also like check. Definitely. Thank you, Nozomi. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So thank you very much for this. It was really good. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm look, I'm, I would really like to see it in practice because I totally agree that this is one of the skills that uh, I mean, we are missing in general. And it, it's something that has been going on for years and years. And it's not only a nowadays uh, problem, maybe now even more relevant than before. Um, but for a very long time, we've been, we've been looking for this, how to practice the theory um, that we are learning. Thank you for that. And we are moving on to the group number one. Um, and the topic of uh, the title of their session, their presentation will be Top Up Edu, tailored to your learning style. And uh, I think everyone here uh, in the group uh, committed to the presentation will even see videos. So. Zoom is yours. So um, our solution is a top up solution that is specifically to tailor um, to students learning styles in higher education. So our problem that we outlined 
is the idea that university education, a real difference from school, is the idea that personalization seems to go out the window. There's traditional teaching and students are expected to adapt to fit into that, largely because teaching is happening at such a scale. But if you have a particular learning style that isn't catered for, this could lead to lower attainment or a lack of engagement, definitely frustration and uh, possibly even dropout rates. So we wanted to start with this idea of, um, you know, that's fine if university teaching suits you, but what if you're a square peg trying to fit into a round hole? Um, in terms of validating our problem, we decided to interview fellow students. We established a set of key questions to see if our views were in fact the, the views of others. Um, we wanted to get an understanding of how people prefer to learn and whether or not they felt the style of learning at university suited them. We asked about positive experiences and negative experiences. And particularly, we were interested in finding out what strategies people used to overcome the challenge of uh, learning in a way that didn't necessarily suit them best. We used empathy maps to share the details with one another. And um, here are some of the outcomes that we identified. Um, unsurprisingly, there was a real range of preference in how people liked to study best. And in synthesizing it alongside the idea of people wanting to learn in different ways and in practical ways and have opportunity to learn it and accommodate for different learning styles, there was this idea that people felt the need to top up their learning by making new resources or seeking out additional resources and finding supplementary material. So we thought that this was an area we could use ed tech to support the students in that personalization. Binji. So to tackle those, those problems, we have come up with this loop. So this loop comprises five stages. And at the first stage, which is the learning di uh, diagnostic, when learners first use our ed tech, they will be invited to fill in a questionnaire by which we can diagnose their preferred learning styles. The questions included in the questionnaire include what type of learning style do you prefer? For example, text-based, PowerPoint-based, video-based. Uh, what learning environment and what time do you prefer to study? Entering the second phase, upon their completion of their questionnaire, we will create a personalized learning style profile for each individual. The third phase is that, um, according to each person's personalized profile, we will draw on our resources in our database to provide tailored content and pedagogy resources for them to learn. And our database is underpinned by university administrators, professors, and outside resources. Arriving at the fourth stage, when learners use our provided resources to supplement their learning, we can match them with others of similar styles to boost collaboration. So. In the final stage, where students provide feedbacks, evaluation of the effectiveness and usefulness of our recommended resources, and their evaluations will inform higher institutions, higher education institutions of course design improvement, and will also drive quality assurance of our recommended resources. So in the end, the cycle restarts providing more and more accurate, tailored content for users based on the data we have collected. Okay. Hello, today, um, myself, Penelope, and Evelyn over here are going to be presenting the business model canvas for our service called Top Up Edu. And to start off, we're going to be looking at the customer segment. So for who exactly are we creating value for? And we decided that we are going to be um, a niche market specifically targeting universities and um, institutions of higher education that are already well established and advanced in implementing technologies in education. And we would be perhaps even taking a COIL approach. So COIL is this collaborative online international learning where universities would work together in order to establish um, these core courses. 
the value proposition. We add value by offering personalized and additional content to the learner, the end user. His participation and performance will increase. This will lead to um, better uh, freshman retention and graduation, graduation rates. And this means better scores for the universities. Universities will build in this way a broad database of content in different learning styles. And with the data analytics, they will gain deeper insights. And then moving on to customer relationships. So the relationship we're going to be having is a collaborative and, and co-creational approach. Ideally, we want to be collaborating with the universities and the professors um, to create um, content together in order to foster and retain this, this, um, this enhanced, um, uh, this long-term relationship in order to continuously work together over a long span of time. The channels, so how will we reach our customers? We will have an in-house sales team and we will work together with partners like learning management system providers. We will also have a website. Next to this, it's very important to attend to educational conferences and congresses so we can be seen as a top leader and expert in this topic. Okay, and then moving on to the revenue stream. So in terms of pricing mechanisms and um, in order to generate revenue, we decided that we would be implementing subscription licenses that would be um, sold or, or offered to the university based on the amount of users and modules that, that are offered. Our key partners are cloud computing services and learning management systems but also we will collaborate with the universities. In terms of key resources, we have primary our data and the tool and the semantic AI researchers. And secondary, we have the knowledge that is, um, the knowledge that is adapted to the students' learning styles. So moving on to the key activities and the things that are gonna help make our business run. Firstly, we're gonna need um, software development, diagnostics, then um, content creation and this type of feedback loop in order for the, the universities and our service to um, work together in order to constantly iterate and improve um, the system. Last but not least, we go to cost structure. The two main costs are people, the salaries and software and software infrastructure. The expertises that we need are um, quite uh, expensive, but it's smart and it's needed to be in the core team. For other things, we can um, appeal on freelancers if we need more. Perfect, and that sums up our business model canvas, and now we'll give the stage back to our team in order to present the rest. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this uh, brings us to like why the solution, why top up edu. So our solution began with the answer to the question of what need is the technology answer to. Um, and the need was that the current system, uh, can you change the slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And the need was that the current system, be it the blended hybrid or virtual learning, is not very learner-centric. It is just a replacement of the uh, old methods. So the textbooks kind of went on to reading resources uh, in LMS. Uh, lectures became videos. Uh, group activities kind of became forum discussions and so on. So if you look at three learners, uh, let's say Ron is an auditory learner, Dora is a visual learner, and um, June is, let's say, kinesthetic learner, they were all forced to mold their learning with a one-size-fits-all approach that may not have uh, be fitting for every one of them properly. So they kind of do the heavy lifting, navigating through the maze and figuring out how to learn as uh, shown by the validation process where uh, most of the students kind of gave us similar answers. Uh, so we were kind of designing for one size fits all. Um, next slide. Uh, so initially we began with the thought that the university systems need to move from a replacement, uh, technology as replacement to like uh, transformation. But we also realized through our validation process that the existing system is working for some of the students at least. Um, so then we, we 
kind of moved on from thinking of a transformation to just supplementing the uh, te using technology as a supplement to the uh, existing system uh, the, that existing system in the universities um, so what we thought of this bite sized solution which can easily be plugged into the um, learning management systems that currently exist um, and through this uh, we aim to transform the education uh, uh, of all the learners um, so as a result of the solution uh, we can expect motivation participation and hopefully lower dropout rates and higher attainment so it's a win win uh, for university and students because um, it aims to create happy successful learners at the same time the universities do not we need not be overwhelmed by um, a lot of uh, uh, technical uh, uh, technology. Uh, we can need not be overwhelmed by technology. Um, so, so the, the resources kind of be a better fit for every individual learner. Yeah. And to conclude, uh, and to conclude, uh, you can be uh, now uh, around all um, to to put a square hole uh, uh, in your brain. Of course, students are not uh, only holes. Uh, we are hiring in our companies because as you can understand, we set up new jobs, uh, not only learning designers, but new jobs. We don't know the name of these new jobs we will uh, set up in our company, but you are welcome to, uh, to, to send your application to come in our company with strong, strong revenues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, group number one. Uh, actually, while you were presenting, there were a very important conversation going on uh, on the chat. And Alison, uh, would you mind uh, sh showing yourself and unmuting yourself and, uh, and summarize what happened over there? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the thing is, is that, you know, where, this whole idea that their learning preferences exist, right? No one is going to debate that we have preferences in the way we want to approach content, um, experience content. That, that's, that's not um, the thing that's debated here. The challenge is that the idea that it's desirable to give a learner their preferred learning style because that will lead to a better outcome in their education is, is the issue here. So this is what's been sort of debunked. Um, initially, it was thought that if we gave people the sort of material they liked, they would actually do better. And the studies are showing that's not necessarily the case. Now, I'm never, I'm never fully, you know, any research is always going to be added to and it will evolve. But I think the point here is that, you know, even when you go to design an ed tech, you've got some underpinning values or ideas about what you think learning is and what you think learning should look like. And you sort of have a responsibility to, to look at the research that that supports that. Now, very often we go to the thing that supports what we want to do. It's quite natural to want to do that, but to have a really balanced view and then either make that explicit that, you know, this might be something that is debatable or the suggestion by Italo where you just pivot the project and just slightly give it to the students to be choosing rather than this sense that um, the tech is going to make it so that you get what you want. And it's a really difficult, it's a real dilemma when you start to build out ed tech that is going to be putting things on your learning plate according to any sort of algorithms, decision making, you get into really dodgy ground um, because you really have to be confident that your algorithms are not inadvertently going to a disadvantage a student by only giving them what they like. And I think a healthy eating plate is a great way to think about it. If you let children choose, they choose what they like. They tend not to have a healthy choice. It's the, there's some responsible other that has to come in and moderate or mediate or, or, or help that along. Uh, but I say, we saw lots of companies come in with this sort of product in Educate. It seems such an obvious, easy one to go for. Uh, we had these conversations and it was a real ethical dilemma for them when they started to build out their project, you know, products and they were marketing. What do you do as an ed tech uh, uh, company when you find out that some of the underpinning ideas for your product are contentious or, or not straightforward. Real, real problems for ed techs, these are. <laughs> but well, no, well done, because it, it's, it's, it just highlights how even at that starting stage, 
um, really going deeply, which obviously students, you didn't have time to do this. <laughs> but you know, if you were going to be building out this product, that early review of the literature, that early look at the marketplace, look at what's out there is so important. Mm. I think I think in terms of pivoting, we probably <clears throat> we would if finding out that the idea of learning styles and what have you wouldn't have the desired effect. We would still, I think, look to try and resolve what was borne out through the validation, which is if students are having to go and do their own. And part of it is that that's part of the university experience. And we acknowledge that that, you know, you're not at school anymore. And the idea is you do develop as a learner. And in the workplace, it's not going to shift around you to personalise your workplace. So there is that journey a student needs to be on. But at the same time, if we have a number of students that are using their time sifting and searching for things to supplement what they're doing in order to better understand and to make sense of what they're learning, then there must be a solution around being able to assist that search and, and suggest and direct suitable resources. So I think maybe we would have pivoted down that route. And as I think Italo mentioned, it's about personalizing yes. rather than learning styles. Yes. But yes, I think there is, there's definitely something in this space to be exploited, but. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I just remember, it, even though there's no sort of direct causal link that putting learning styles in, in, in front, you're having that learning style rhetoric in front of learners um, is going to improve the outcomes. You can't assume the converse, which means not doing that won't um, disadvantage them. And that's the challenge is the research has been done on offering things in a, in, in a way that is sort of steers towards learning styles. The research hasn't been done on whether not doing that. <laughs> so it's very easy to misassume that because something hasn't proved something, then the converse is true when actually we don't know is, is the answer. So still a very, uh, still a very ripe area for research as well. Yeah, and it it could be a, also a good opportunity for universities to work on their on on the skills, uh, which skills they want to promote, and how they want to promote these different skills, and not only the the divide between hard skills and soft skills, but uh, the, the the different hard skills we can have and the different soft skills we need to teach, um, and. Um, we could have a consultancy part in a, in our edtech company helping universities to to work on their skills because most some of some of the universities are not able to clearly identify which skills they are preparing yeah if I might come in, I think I mentioned in the chat that universal design is an angle that I think you should really look at because there's there's the world around if you've adapted something to me based, as Alison said, on an algorithm, there's a kind of a question, what's going on in the black box? What makes you decide that's for me? But adaptable is a completely different world where I go in and I see that this content's available in these different formats. And I decide this is the one that I want to go for on that day, right? So that might be to do with how I'm feeling that day. Another day, I might want the other one. But so I, I would, that's where I would pivot from here. And also universal designs uh, sort of stakeholding is in the ascendancy right now. It's very, very much kind of being looked at as, as a way to approach it. So I think without too much of a shift, it would be an area worth putting a bit of time into. Great, thank you. Katrin, uh, I saw your comment over there and a very good question. Would you like asking it out loud? Okay. <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm an outsider, I have no experience in um, research in um, education technology. Um, my question was, universities are also businesses, so they have to think of their stakeholders in terms of students are paying high tuition fees. And my observation um, in an international context, as we in Germany don't have tuition fees, is that in other places, when you are a private university and have to think of your customers, you have to offer things, even if there's no um, um, pedagogical effect or if research shows it, it doesn't matter. Is that yeah. a... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was... <laughs> Did I you finish? 
I think customer satisfaction is key really there in the sense that let's say your module one week is presenting something very complex and difficult to get your head around and a number yeah. of students are having difficulty with it. Having mm -hmm. only research papers as your mm -hmm. source of, of learning isn't as accessible as for example, in another module where you may have research papers, some links to some TED talks or a keynote lecture, some mm. diagrams trying to map out the same information in a different way. And mm. so really it's having that range, which again is this idea of something being adaptable. That, okay. means, that yes, I think, so that's the idea. You would be happier as a customer if you had more to choose from. But then I suppose Alison's point about the children and the eating is, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. You're going to eat wholemeal pasta, and I know you would love to have all these other things as well. But if you can't eat wholemeal pasta, you're not going to have a nutritious diet. So there, there's probably somewhere in between the two of keeping students happy and feeling like they're not only eating wholemeal pasta all the time, okay. yeah. and and keeping that that you know benefit of a balanced diet. Yeah, it's also to to you can reduce the dropout, you know, if you if you adapt the learning styles, and don't uh, don't forget that, for instance, in United States, the challenge of retention and dropout is sometimes sixty thousand uh, dollars a year. Uh, it means an around the three hundred thousand dollars for the the whole bachelor or the whole master, you know. So that it, it's it's a main challenge for retention and um, uh, uh, fight against uh, dropout. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Uh, and we can we could be paid in our tech company with a success fee, you know, in the uh, decreasing uh, dr dropout uh, rate. Yeah, great. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> revenue model. <laughs> Thank you, Maxime. Thank you, Dina. Thank you all very much. Uh, here, Johanna also uh, made a very interesting comment. Do you want to learners that are happy or do you want to learners that actually learned something? And then Alison <laughs> said, well, in Finland, you have a free education. You have that problem <laughs> in the UK. It's a different story. So who look how, how different it is depending on the market that we are looking at. So, of course, we can ask these questions. And I think it's great that this presentation sparked this conversation because it's so relevant. So thank you so much for this, especially. But also, um, when looking at the European edtech market, European educational market, we always have to um, well start small. So look uh, at very specific market where we want to start, and then zoom out, look at the the whole Europe, and adjust always. So we, there, there's so much to learn in in terms of um, knowing educational uh, market in Europe. We are so 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 different, uh, and I think it's it's amazing. So much to to learn from that. Thank you. Um, and now we are moving to the last group, group number four. Uh, the title of their presentation is Connect Us, Promoting Cultural Awareness in Higher Education Online Learning Context through EdTech. <laughs> Farah, I think yeah. it will be you, right? Yes, yes, it's me. Yours. Okay. Okay, is it clear? Is everybody, can everybody see? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Farah Batiyah, and I'm going to be representing group number four. And the title of our presentation is called Connect Us. Now, to start to introduce our topic, I would like to give a nice brief introduction to, uh, talking about how we have reached a time where not only are we separated by the kilometric distances between us, we are also separated by this digital divide that has dawned upon us ever since technology has been introduced to our world. Um, we are growing further apart, second by second, and uh, in an era where ironically, the world is literally in our hands. Because with the devices that we have and all, you can you can literally go anywhere you want in the world with only with only one single click. We get it, we get it that we have distancing, we have COVID and all, but is, is that distance worth it? Is it, is it should, should our cultures be far apart from each other just uh, due, due to that, due to the digital, uh, due to, um, 
Okay, here we are, my group members and I, um, representing our solution of Connect Us to the aim of promoting cultural awareness in higher education, online learning context through EdTech. Now, of course, here are the project stages that we all went through as uh, different groups. Number one being the challenge, number two being the research, and three being the solution. Starting with our challenge, of course, after the first workshop where we were all put into different groups, we started talking about many issues that we all faced and we all literally as a group started venting about problems that we have been going through as students. Uh, we explored many, many types of issues such as being lonely, not having social life, uh, the fear of missing out, et cetera, and the, and the cultural shock basically. Um, so if we were to connect them all to each other, we, we can give it a huge title of inclusivity in ed tech. These are the issues we talked about. Of course, they need to be tackled right now in today's online learning context, because um, this might be the future for, for learning. And, for learning. So basically, the challenge in summary is the lack of opportunities to promote cultural awareness in the use of ed tech in higher education online learning context. Because of course, many of us are from different cultures, different parts of the world. So this cultural awareness is really necessary, especially in this online learning context. Um, of course, the users, the user groups that we have chosen uh, that are chosen here are the students from different levels and the university system and the lecturers or the teachers. Um, so basically, just to give the lit literature review or the part of the research process, we came to answer the question of is education technology really neutral? Because technology is not about the components that make it. It's not about just uh, having the, the parts, the software, the hardware, whatever, the, or an application, whatever it is. It is more than just the artifacts. It is more about what's associated with it, the context it is made in. It is more about the culture around it. So when we come to talk about technologies and come to analyze technologies, it is more, more complex than, uh, than just talking about the elements it has, the elements that make it up. Of course, technology and culture are co-constructed. They come together, but uh, but there is an inequality there. There is a bias. Um, it can because technology can never, never be separated from the maker nor the context that it is made in. So, with that being said, technology can be designed both with uh, both with to exclude or be biased against certain groups. Uh, technology can be for some certain groups and can be against certain groups. So we have to consider that despite the fact that they both come together, they both are correlated and, uh, uh, and all, uh, and both co-evolve together, but in order for a change to be made or a cultural difference to be made or for any, for cultural awareness to be made, this, need to be, uh, this needs to be intentionally introduced by us humans. This needs to be aim of creating a certain technology. If, that may, if, uh, if you. And uh, moreover, uh, the kids have been claimed to democratize education to be available in every culture. However, there are studies that prove that most MOECs are uh, our students are from middle class background in Western, Western countries. So with that, with that being said, there are many emerging countries that are not even participating in MOOCs because as rich research proves, uh, the necessary infrastructure that, uh, that MOOCs need, uh, there are certain countries that do not even have them. For example, in the case of Bernini, 97% of the population live without electricity. So MOOCs were designed for a certain uh, or a specific culture uh, and dog. Uh, of course, this extends more than just MOOCs, but uh, MOOCs example. Uh, not only that, but many ed tech initiatives fail to take um, into account issues such as the low digital literacy rate in some countries. So not, not having any literacy rate or having low literacy rate can affect the type of technology that is there, can affect the learning process, can, can really, it can really be a struggle for many, many countries and many citizens. Uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, in addition to that, the research showed that people with disabilities have problems when using digital technologies because some applications, some platforms, uh, some ad tech methods are, are, do not take into consideration the necessities uh, of people with disabilities. Because like some people have hearing issues, some people uh, are put off by unwanted noises, and um, the list really goes on. So how engaging is online learning? Um, from 2012, as you can see, to 2018, the MOOCs by MIT and Harvard were only completed by 3% of the participants, uh, down from 6% in 2015. Uh, so yeah. After this literature review that uh, made us like, talk about the cultures and all introduced why that technology is not inclusive, honestly, which uh, was the peak of our problem, we, can, we are going to talk about another part of the research, which was interviews that were carried out. We interviewed seven, seven students, seven people. Uh, we asked demographic questions just to order, in order to be provided uh, of a context of the culture and all, and also asked knowledge, attitudinal and uh, behavior questions just to uh, get a grab of their opinions. Uh, so basically, uh, when it comes to the interviews, the, the demographic parts, we had different genders. Of course, it's a bit biased for females, but against males, of course, but uh, we also had different ages from the age group of 18 until 50. Uh, we also had different parts of education. Some, some are high school students, some are masters, some are bachelor, doing their bachelor degrees. Uh, different races uh, from different countries, China, Jordan, Myanmar, Saudi, Mali, UAE. Uh, different occupations, some are students studying full-time, some are working full-time, some are working part-time and all. So, uh, so to say, um, we literally involved like a huge group, so we can say that our sample or the interviewees were quite representative because it, it, it is a huge circle, you know, it, because they're from different contexts, different parts of the world, different occupations and so on. Uh, so the key insights that we've uh, gotten from uh, these interviews or our main findings are basically that online learning technologies are great for the academic communication for us to learn through them, but uh, it's, it's not really for social communication. Uh, they're not that bad with, like, to promote the social life between students, between people, between a teacher and the student and so on. Because as one of the interviewees said that it is a weakness because sometimes we people need each other. We need to interact. We need that human interaction. It's not all about academic activities and tasks, but our social life, getting to know each other's cultures and experiences. This is all a part of academic education. Um, in addition to that, another key insight uh, is knowledge, knowledge, knowledge and learning is more than it's related to the first point that it's more than academic knowledge, it is also social and it is not really addressed as much as it needs to be addressed. Uh, and of course, um, the supporting point is the same as the one before. Um, in addition to that, lack of knowledge and technology is a disadvantage and it can act, impact performance. So if, if really we do not, if we have a low digital literacy rate, we wouldn't even be on the Zoom call, honestly. Um, so it can impact our, uh, impact our performances because as one of the interviewees said that she, this was her first time, her first experience in online learning. Some people had it before and so she, she had to learn both how to interact online, how to, uh, how to work this platform out and learn the academic part. So this is why it impacts her performance because she had no idea how to uh, work on the, Online, um, online platforms. Uh, um, another thing is, uh, another key insight is that idea uh, that it is a technology is a double-edged sword, you know? Learning technologies can just encourage social exchange, but it can also be a solution to this problem. So like, it's literally the best of both worlds. Um, so as one of our interviewees also said, I think technology can be the solution to the problems it has created. Um, so basically, here we can provide you with the student needs, the, the or description of our challenge, what the students expect. 
basically they want an, a network, a network to talk, to socialize with each other, to meet new people, to experience different cultures, be, uh, and to see career opportunities and academic improvement. Um, uh, so yeah, because because there's no social engagement support, sc there's scattered and not sufficient in st stimulating student social engagement. Like not, not we cannot we can really find programs that are focused on just uh, fixing the engagement between students or just supporting the fact that there, there should be a social engagement with, between students. So yeah, um, before we, we get to our solution, we need to provide a few benchmarks of what others or how others dealt with such, such a problem or the solutions they have provided. Uh, because not only does it exist in the student life or the teacher life, it exists more in the corporate world as well. So the community for accredited schools online identified areas that where teachers and students can connect, for example, in the classroom and outside the classroom, especially when it is, it is made up of many uh, of students from many different cultures. So outside the classrooms, some workshops or events that can happen are like about food and diet, socioeconomic status, languages, religion, ethnicity. These are some, um, some workshops that students can actually connect and provide different opinions and overviews about. As for inside the classroom, they can handle conflict, they can solve problems, uh, students and teachers can establish a nice relationship, uh, engagement can happen in the classroom. As for the Birkbeck, uh, which is the University of London, a research center there promoted the benefits of linguistic and cultural diversity and inclusion. With that being done, what they did with that aim in mind, what they did was to have lots of events and activities and courses just to do that aim and to prom promote uh, cultural diversity and inclusion, because it is really, really essential. Not only that, but there's a training group known as uh, for diversity, essential concepts and unconscious bias awareness training. This center had done many trainings to promote diversity and inclusion in the workplace, because um, because as I mentioned earlier, it is not all about just students in the higher, uh, higher, uh, higher ed. It's also, it also exists everywhere, especially in the workplace. So moving on finally to our solution. Um, a first idea was elaborated to solve the detected issue. And then we also developed a business plan for it. Um, what's made us develop this um, plan also, or this solution is because a student mentioned that she is from a culture, different cultural background, so technology implementation is in her culture, or the use of technology is different from the technology used in the culture of other people, which shows the digital divide, which shows how the differences in culture prevails over anything. Of course, so the solution that we decided is known as Connect Us, which is a system that is connected with different, different learning platforms that actually guide us as students through AI to promote cultural awareness between peers. Uh, how, how does it work? Basically, it, uh, uh, through an initial survey, it's, it's going to ask you or get to know you better, to get our, to know our cultural background, uh, just like a demographic interview that we made, but even more detailed. And, uh, and through an AI data system, it gets, it gets to know you and um, like shape what type of person you are or who you are. With this, it will tailor the content and suggestions to each profile, which will promote diverse experiences, which we will receive diverse experiences to address the lack of cultural awarenesses, uh, cultural awareness. Um, so what, what really are the content? The contents? Um, the system will suggest the user's content in different, different formats, such as events, such as articles, activities, festivals that they can attend. And it, it, of course, all depends on the major point, which is initial survey, because it, it, sh it helps shape the profile of the user. And based on that, different experiences will be promoted. Also, it will suggest the partnering up with, the, with another student, for example, in, in, through a Zoom call or in real life. Uh, all students from different backgrounds can meet up and get to know each other. So what are the basic features um, or uh, prevailing features in this program or system? It is it, uh, the first feature is collaboration and content building and the integrated platform for social activities and platforms. And it can be easily accessed through a phone, a mobile, a PC or, or laptops. 
So the solution, why why the solution or why should I convince you or why why this solution prevails? It's because it is it provides an inclusive cultural pool created by this platform. Could it could be applied to online learning, it could be applied to face-to-face -face or blended learning. Anybody can access it because there are students from different countries and they can all communicate and interact with each other uh, and be joined up together. Not only that, but it promotes cultural awareness due to the events that will be proposed, for example, the articles that will be proposed to, read, to be read and the Zoom calls and all that. Because it enhances students' social activities and makes a better engagement in studies. So to just provide um, a quick insight of how it works, first of all, you start with a survey and then it, it, it makes your profile as who you are or where you, you should be associated through, an, of course, an AI system. Then the learning part is like getting pop-up notifications or, or on your calendar that, oh, you have an event to do that. You have, for example, an article, what happened in, for example, India or a celebration that uh, is being done in Finland or whatever it is like th that's how our program is going to work in addition to then connecting us to um, other people for example through a seminar a workshop uh, or a zoom call like that is the virtual aspect of it or face to face some people can like say oh well, let's meet up face to face through restaurants festivals events um, so yeah, that's how the connection happens, and that's how the cultural part is um, is quite uh, is getting connected to each other. So to provide last but not least our business model canvas, we can say our key partners are of course the same users that we mentioned earlier. In addition to the student council and reps, student societies, embassies, and local community, because they they are the restaurants that we have, they are the cultural centers, the museums, and all that. They are the providers of the events. We also have the university administration. Not only that, but the key activities that, uh, that are essential for us are the recommendation engine. For example, after seeing your profile and altering it, we can find out the activities and the peer connections that have to be made. We also need an AI system, and we need to be focused on content creation, like what's the event going to be, what's, what's the workshop going to be about, the seminar, and so on. The key resources that are needed are, of course, software, hardware, and, and HR. Uh, the value propositions, like why, what do we need, what's the aim, what do we want exactly? We want to educate students, we want to try our best to help the minorities that are literally digitally isolated. And we want to bridge this educational gap, bridge the digital divide, bridge the cultural gap. We need to increase awareness on everything that's going on in the world, Every that, the different people that we don't know, we never communicated with. We need to decrease the social cultural differences. We all need to unite because as we all know, like in unity, there is strength. We need to bring the students together and we need the student well-being because uh, really social interaction can actually be something that's even worse. Uh, lack of social interaction can be worse than the COVID disease, honestly. Uh, not only that, but we also need to promote cultural inclusivity. Uh, the key relations are the, the ones we need to like, communicate with our universities, local community and emb embassies and students and staff. Um, the key segments our focus will be on like first year students and the international student community, some instructor, instructors and the local students, of course. Um, the channels, like how is it going to be done? What, what, what's, what, how, uh, what's the platform that's going to be used, for example, where, what? emails, learning platforms, social media, events, clubs and societies, Zooms and, uh, and e-events, e electronic events, of course. The cost structure, um, it's also, as, as we mentioned, is going to be on the software and hardware and organizing of staffs, uh, of the staff and organizing of the events, the content material, and of course, we need to market um, our, our system and, and promote it, and of course, the IT. IT departments and the revenue streams. How is it going to be funded? What's how, what's going to be it to enable us to do that? It is the funds by university student relations. It's the budget by certain embassies that are set. Um, the Ministry of Education and the advertising promotion uh, and promoters and sponsorships. 
and uh, thank you and please invest and connect us. <laughs> thank you, Farah. Um, I see many questions here in the um, uh, in the chat, but before before that, I think that the element that I like the most about what you what you presented is um, the ability to connect with the um, with the information so to learn. If I'm especially uh, when I'm just entering university and I've never been in an international environment before, to know that. For example, in my group, in my class, there are people from you know, Germany, India, China, and from time to time to have this pop-up information saying, oh, did you know that right now in China, they are celebrating this and that? And this could help me learning about uh, my peers in the in the classroom. So that that point is, is something that I especially like. And uh, yeah, well done. Well done for the presentation. Well done for, for your group work. Um, and now going to, to the questions, um, Ar yeah, let me check them out. Yeah, Arno, Arno is asking uh, if the, your platform takes language differences into account because not all people are fluent English speakers and uh, I can imagine you need a fast and advanced translating software in order to enhance conversations. So did you, well, did you think about it? We can, I can answer that, Farah, if you want. <laughs> okay, go on. Yeah. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, so we haven't go like that deep in to develop like that specific uh, feature of the present uh, of the app or the system because it's basically going to be like working along with learner learning platform but could be a really a really important thing to integrate basically uh, that is a thing normally like language especially in the first years of stu studying uh, is a key uh, problem that can like um, drive a lot of like issues when you're interacting so could be a thing like for now is more focused in like basically suggesting like events and suggesting like connections. So it's not going to be like the people is connecting through like the system It's more like they makes people connect and they go together to an event or they attend the same workshop, for example. So then they are left with the Google Translate if they struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, great, thanks. And Dina is saying, do you think uh, this will continue to be as effective and relevant in a post-COVID world? Uh, no, because the post, uh, go on, go on. <clears throat> okay, I will go with this question. Uh, surely I think that uh, the cultural wellness is really important even after the COVID period. Yeah. Uh, because no matter, uh, even for the face-to-face -face education, students from different cultures, they have different cultural backgrounds, behaviors, customers, a better understanding about each other can, can facilitate the communication and the education activities. So I think it makes great sense even after the COVID period, yeah. But do you think that uh, then it should be uh, the system, the platform that you are proposing, or should it be more implemented into the everyday life at the university? Uh, I think uh, that uh, the every uh, uh, in integrated into the everyday life in the university is really important. And uh, uh, from this app, students, uh, for example, for, for international students like me, uh, uh, I was going to uh, study in, in London. I come from China. And uh, even before the, the start of the program, if there's something like this, uh, a cultural awareness pool with different cultural information, uh, I, can to get, I can get a better understanding about students from other cultures. And uh, after I go to the university and meet other people virtually or physically, I can better accommodate into the new uh, environment and uh, to get a better academic performance or engagement. Yeah. Very good point. So start learning about your peers and about uh, the university world and the university community that you will be part of even before you will enter the, the university because then you find out that you already have something in common. You already know something about that other person. Very good point. Thank you. And um, Alison, fundamental question. Do we want our every move in our lives uh, to be tracked, matched, uh, de directed? Uh, what might the inadvertent consequences of this be? Who owns our data? Who benefits from our data? Who controls the underlying algorithm and etc.? If I may answer that, 
Uh, I think the university should keep that data to track perhaps diversity and the students, but it should not be used against the students, but it's more to know what type of students are there who are uh, the like the nationalities that come to the students. Can I finish this first? <laughs> who are the students who come to this to the class? What are their interests? What are the gaps that are in the information? Because like you would notice that there are patterns about what is it that you don't know about certain cultures. And I think then by default, the student, the university will be able to identify what are the biases or what are the missing information about different cultures. Great, thank you, Siva. And uh, Itala is uh, adding a common Kahoot game to increase cultural awareness into the solution. Could be added? I mean, of course, of course, like we can have also like some Zoom calls where they're, they're just playing a game of Kahoot or like you can do it in person if they prefer that. So yeah, like many, many solutions can be integrated into, into the system, honestly. So it's a good mm -hmm. idea. Why not? I think it would benefit if we join with group one uh, relate us, it's similar to connect us in some way. And I think one of you asked uh, with relate us, if this, uh, like they said that there is content that to be learned and somebody asked if it should be part of the curriculum. And I uh, would like to say, and I told my group that 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, I studied in Birzeit University in Palestine. And in Birzeit University, 20 years ago in Palestine, we, we had, to study two courses, six credits of cultural studies, where we need to learn about cultural studies. They were uh, mandatory credits. We had to learn Arabic, two courses, which were mandatory, even though everyone speaks Arabic. And we had to learn English as well, which was based on your level. And we had to do 120 hours of voluntary work. And you cannot graduate without doing all of this. So I think that needs to be implemented in almost everywhere that you really have to have those mandatory hours where you learn about different cultures and your peers. But I think the modern like sort of AI will help you know about the people you are in class with you. So instead of knowing maybe about someone in, uh, I don't know, Japan, for instance, I would know more about China because I have John in my class. So it would be a little bit more uh, relative or related than just... Uh... Totally, especially in the, in the nowadays world when not only because of the, of the um, COVID situation, but in general, so many courses and so many masters, bachelor degrees, they move online. So you naturally, you connect uh, with people from all, all around the world. Well, now in, in Oulu, they have the third, I think, Johanna, third cohort of MEE, a course. And uh, there are people uh, that, that meet I know, four times a year uh, face to face, but the majority of their course is happening online. And there will be more and more of them um, every year, I think. So definitely it's really, really important for all of us to, to learn who we are with, to, um, to integrate this into, into our everyday life because the world is getting smaller and smaller. And I think it's a great direction that we go to that we can learn uh, that not only our way of seeing the world is, is the good one and the only one, but we can face exact same situation in a completely different way. And both ways will be, will be the correct ones, will be good. So we can learn from each other a lot. It would be a shame to miss this opportunity. So thank you for making this point. Um, great, uh, great conversation, great presentation. Uh, thank you to all four groups. Um, and this is the end of the session uh, number one today. Uh, in the afternoon, we meet today at 3 p.m. Central European time, so one hour later than normally. And uh, in uh, one hour and a half, we will be uh, first having a presentation of these things that the universities don't know about educational technology and education in general. And I'm really curious what our experts will say. Do they know or they don't know <laughs> all these things that, uh, that will be mentioned? Um, and then uh, we will wrap up, as I said, with the panel presentation to uh, hear from all four universities and the student representatives. So thank you very much for the morning session. Go ahead, have some uh, coffee, lunch, or whichever time zone you're in, uh, rest a bit and we'll see each other in the afternoon.